What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. Welcome our man's Noah back for another Thursday video. Uh, there are probably no more leagues where the trades are still going on, so uh, we have to find a way to figure out different types of content. And we're going to go back to the Q&A, kind of like a mailbag, sit-start um, format for this video, probably going forward. And what we did was take a few of the questions from, uh, from our Patreon members, and we're going to answer them for you. Some of them are trades, some of them are sit-starts, um, some of them are just NFL football-related questions. And uh, Patreon is a platform in which you can support your favorite creators. If you want personalized answers from myself and Noah, we're creeping on the forums on there at all times. You get my weekly rankings. You get a private live stream. You can go check that out at patreon.com slash BDGE. Uh, just a, a lot more access than you would get normally to me via YouTube or Twitter because I can't always get around to answering all 50,000 of y'all's questions. I apologize if I don't get to your questions. But that is a way that 99.9% .9 of the time we will get around to those questions. Um, Noah, welcome back. I know this is your, your second time on the channel. You're looking for a little bit of, of redemption after, uh, after the constructive criticism that you received. How are we feeling? How are we doing on this fine Wednesday morning? A little better. Hopefully you guys can hear me this time around. I know last time I sounded like I was whispering, so I moved the mic closer. Minor setback for a major comeback. Love that. Love that. Yeah, you got a little bit more bark in your audio this time. It's exactly what we're <laughs> looking for. So without further ado, we're going to play the theme music and let's get down. All right, so the first Patreon question comes from my man Darnell. Longmire sounds like someone that should be in the uh, series of unfortunate events um, novels, but his, his question, I'm not really sure what he was doing <laughs> when he originally said bye, he wrote B I. So, you know, I asked him to follow up, sir. And uh, his question was quote unquote, Oh fam. I didn't know what the hell that is. LOL. Uh, I'll ask something since I'm here though. How do you feel about Humphrey's rest of season? And do you think that that offense is high powered enough for, their receiving core to be stack worthy. Humphreys, Brait or Evans Brait. Sorry for the length. G, have a great morning and appreciate the work. Thank you, Darnell. I hope you have a fucking fantastic morning. Thank you for the question. Thank you for being a supporter on Patreon. Now, we attack this, this answer from uh, a season long perspective. When you say stack, I think a lot of people probably think of DFS, but we're going to keep it season long. And uh, this probably, the answer to this will probably help you kind of uh, narrow it down uh, a little better either way. And I know. Noah, you are a big proponent of Adam Humphreys, and uh, you know you, you are someone who's kind of pushing him on the on the Twitter sphere. So why don't you kind of take the first crack at this? How are you feeling about Adam Humphreys right now? Are you putting him in the lineup? Um, so let's stick with that first, and then we'll kind of get to the the stack part of the question. Yeah, I think for Humphreys, he's kind of like cemented himself as a wide receiver three. I know I tweeted it out he's been a top twenty four receiver for the past five weeks. Um, different responses to that tweet. Almost <laughs> got fired for it. But, yeah. you know, he's getting a lot of looks. I mean, Deshaun Jackson, I don't know what happened to him. I guess he's seen a specialist. O.J. Howard is done. I mean, their best tight end right now is Cameron Brait. He's not a guy who's in the hog targets, just mostly end zone looks. Um, Mike Evans obviously doesn't get his. And then Godwin, you know, he's kind of inconsistent, but he'll get some looks too. But for a team that passes or has the fourth most pass attempts in the NFL over the past three weeks, um, you know, he's going to get the volume and running out of the slot most of the time. I think it's somewhere in the, like, 85% of the time. He's going to get looks. He's going to draw easier matchups. He gets um, Carolina and uh, the Saints over the next two weeks. The Saints have been good against receivers, but they're going to have to score. The Saints are dropping 50 like it's nothing. So they're going to have to keep up, and for sure I'm going to keep uh, rolling with Humphreys in my lineup. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, um, the reason I asked how many times I could fire you after you tweeted out, out the, hum the Humphrey status because I hate pushing guys like Humphreys because throughout the history of fantasy football in the NFL, we've seen Adam Humphreys before, right? And it was in the form of Cole Beasley and it was in the form of Danny Amendola. And it was in the, f I feel like we've been here with Adam Humphreys before too. I feel like every season there's a little stretch where we get a little Adam Humphreys buzz going. And as soon as you advocate for people to start him is the week that he puts up like 1.4 fantasy points. But it can't really be ignored. Like you said, he's been a top 24 fantasy wide receiver four of the last five games, um, and he's done something that not even Adam Thielen has done 
over his last five games, he has thrown up over 53 receiving yards in each of those last five games. It is not a good feat whatsoever, but I just wanted to throw a little bit of uh, shade at Adam Thielen because I'm starting to see Diggs cement himself as – he's not really the wide receiver one there. I'm just hoping and wishing. But – uh, Adam Humphreys has been very good. He has been a really solid piece in PPR. And I was looking over those last five weeks. Uh, he's actually been the wide receiver seven in PPR leagues. And I think the bigger picture here is really looking at the offense overall. And you're talking about how their pass attempt totals have been like humongous over the last few weeks. And we look at these splits with Jameis Winston under center. And the left side is games in which he's attempted more than 20 passes. So you're pretty much looking at the games in which he finished the game as a quarterback or, he, you know, he was the starter and he was, he was their guy that game without Fitzpatrick in the, uh, in the system. And he's averaging almost 26 and a half fantasy points a game in games where he's attempted more than 20 pass attempts. And he's averaging 41 and a half pass attempts, 337 yards. So with Jameis Winston under center, man, like everybody comes into contention as a fantasy factor. And as you said, O.J. Howard's out. Um, so that opens up middle of the field targets. And Deshaun Jackson, he played through his injury last week, but he was highly inefficient. And he's <clears throat> he's seeing a hand specialist for um, either his thumb or his hand or whatever's going on with him. So it's possible he misses time. And the problem with having a quarterback like Jameis Winston, who's putting up monster numbers, um, but he has so many mouths to feed, is choosing, you know, week over week, who are the guys you want to start? And with, you know, the depth chart kind of dwindling down and the targets being – more siphoned to a select number of guys. Adam Humphreys is becoming more and more of a piece of this offense for whatever reason. Um, you know, you, you, you can't hate the player. You got, you got to look at the statistics. You got to, you got to look at the big facts when it comes down to it. And that's why I would agree with you in the fact that Adam Humphreys is a good start going forward because he gets Carolina who've been asked against the pass. That was pretty good right there. That just came off, off the dome right there. New Orleans, like you said, they're going to have to put up a lot of points. They do have two tough matchups after that. I believe they're at, Baltimore at Dallas, but neither of those teams are um, especially good against the slot. Now they are good pass defenses overall, but those are um, not necessarily matchups you have to fade. In terms of like stacking Humphreys with another player, it, it's always going to be you know weekly thing. You have to look at the lineups like who who would be someone that you'd play over Brait or someone that you play over Deshaun Jackson, whoever you're stacking them with. But I have no problem stacking the two because, like I said, the the target funnel is a lot less. Um, big than it was at the beginning of the season because of the injuries. So when you have Jameis Winston performing like a top five fantasy quarterback, you can have multiple weapons in your fantasy lineup because, um, you know, there's a lot of room for people to eat. It's not necessarily a bad offense when you're kind of hoping both of them click when there's a good chance that two or more of the offensive weapons there do in fact give you good fantasy days. Sorry for spewing for so long, but those are my thoughts. You, you agree with that? You can you can throw in multiple guys in that TV offense? That's usually where you say something. That's usually where you say, yes, Nicholas, master, I, I agree, sir. Uh, the, thing, the thing just stopped. Like, I couldn't hear what you said at the very end, for sure, except Peyton Barber. I'm not touching him. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I definitely stack Winston with these next two matchups. Evans, he's a must-start every week. Cameron Brait, there's only a handful of guys that you're really going to start over him at the tight end position. I mean, he's mostly a boomer bust with a touchdown, but, I mean, who else are you really going to think about starting? C.J. Uzoma, who gets like nine targets and two catches a game. It's, it's really a very shallow position. You're not going to start a lot of guys over him. And as for Humphreys, the next two weeks, he's probably like a top 30, top 36 play. So if you play with like one or two flexes, he's going to make your lineup too. I have no problem starting all those guys. Yeah, I don't think – I think a lot of fantasy players kind of get the stigma of – or they look too deep into the, the whole, like, stack factor. And I think you really – it just needs to be on a player-by-player -player basis. And at the end of the day, it's like you could play Adam Humphreys and Cameron Brait, but you don't want to play Brait because – you don't want to play Brait because of stack, but, like, your other option is someone like Ozuma. Like, you're not going to sit him for that. So I think it's more so, like, looking at each individual matchup than worrying about the collective – stack factor if you have it so thank you for the question darnell we're gonna move on to the second question and that is from adam joseph thank you sir um he said uh tight end trade i just lost doyle i offered the njoku owner his choice of doug baldwin M mbs or anthony miller i'm assuming that's miller um for njoku he probably won't accept so if he doesn't should i offer dj Moore or tyler boyd for him or is that still too much i also have juju and allen um, so with Doyle being out, yeah, you're going to need a tight end to ride into the playoff. I mean, looking at the question, if he doesn't accept any of those three, you want to know if you could trade DJ Moore or Tyler Boyd 
for David Njoku? I would say yes. And I would not trade DJ Moore because he's starting to come into his own, right? He's starting to become like the main wide receiver there in Carolina. Um, and he's not someone you want to get rid of right now because he's at like his, his, he's finally putting together consistently productive weeks. Right. And it seems like he's starting to produce like the, the first round wide receiver that he was picked to, um, to produce like, so DJ Moore is definitely someone I'm holding on to and riding high, especially with the, their schedule um, going forward is really, really, really easy starting off with Tampa Bay this week. Tyler Boyd is the guy I'm willing to let go for a tight end. If he would accept that trade um, because Andy Dalton's out, right? So you have this backup quarterback in Jeff Driscoll who did throw a touchdown pass to Tyler Boyd, but I still don't trust any quarterback that comes in, you know, midway through the year at the end of the year, because they, they seem to be very turnover prone. And I don't think, um, I, I don't see like a, a good a good future for this offense with Jeff Driscoll, you know, running the show, along with the fact that AJ Green's going to be back. So um, that was good in the beginning with Dalton there, but now I think it kind of hurts them a little bit. I think it hurts Boyd's just target outlook um, since Driscoll is under center. So I would be okay giving away Boyd. Starts with Denver this week as Chris Harris, so I don't expect any sort of production from him. And then he gets uh, – who does he play after – Denver uh, the Chargers so that's two tough matchups in a row that I'm probably not even going to have Boyd in my lineups and the fact that you have Juju and Keenan Allen so those are two guys that you're not taking out of your lineups for the rest of the season you know so um, with that being said since you still have Doug Baldwin and you still have uh, DJ Moore you know you could play that matchup week to week while Allen and Juju are your wide receiver ones and twos so I think you have enough depth there to take that hit if he does accept the Tyler Boyd for a joker trade I'd be all aboard how are we feeling? Noah, are you buying a ticket on that train? Yeah, I kind of think of it as like during the draft season, you know, the argument for not drafting a quarterback high is because the difference between like the quarterback five and quarterback 15 is such a small difference. It's the same thing here. I mean, for the difference between Njoku and whoever you pick up off waivers is going to be much bigger, much bigger than the difference between DJ Moore and Boyd week to week. So it's really, you got to weigh your options, like the opportunity cost of keeping one guy over another. Like you said, Moore has an easy schedule. So like, the difference between Moore and Boyd week to week is what I'm trying to say won't be as much as the difference between whatever tight end you can pick up uh, between him and, and Joku. Yeah. And especially at this point in the season, when you're not concerned about depth anymore, there's no more bye weeks. You're just looking to get the best starting lineup that you could possibly, um, that you could possibly get. So when you're looking at the trades, like I would, I would almost consider writing your starting lineup down prior to the trade, writing your starting lineup down, after the trade and then seeing what the fall off or the addition to your team is. And in this sense, like you said, the, the difference between Moore and Tyler Boyd, given their schedules, especially going forward, is not going to be a large gap compared to David Njoku versus you having to start um, a CJ Ozuma or a Ben Watson or whatever. So, uh, so yeah, we're, we're both okay with uh, the Boyd for Njoku trade. And we will move on to Anthony's question. <clears throat> he says, pick two – for a standard league this week. Justin Jackson of the Chargers, DJ Moore of the Panthers, Larry Fitzgerald of the Cardinals. I think we both probably agree with sitting Justin Jackson. It, it stands out to me. Um, is that is that your is that who you're sitting to? Yeah. No? yeah. Well, I have a little conspiracy here because this guy's name is Anthony Wynn. I'm pretty sure that's how it's pronounced. And that rhymes with Anthony Lynn. Justin Jackson's on the Chargers. So, mm -hmm. I mean, if you're looking at everything all together, is this guy really just trying to push for Justin Jackson to be the play of the week? I see what you did there, but the fact remains that Justin Jackson is fucking fool's gold. Justin Jackson, if you put Justin Jackson in your lineup, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm near positive that he's going to return. Okay, you know what? I'll, I'll give you a question. Over under Justin Jackson's fantasy points this week. It's a standard league. Over under 3.7 points. Is that 37 yards? 37 yards. I'm going to go under. You're going to go under? I would go I, under maybe as well. like 20 yards. Yeah, I agree. So I, the, I, I think, yeah, by process of elimination, like I don't necessarily love Fitzgerald in a, uh, in a standard league, but I don't think there's any way you can throw Jackson in there. I think people are just kind of riding high on his like efficient game last week where he carried the ball literally seven times, guys. You can't use a, a tiny sample size like that to project future success. I think his yards per carry was like over eight. You have to remember. He was going against the Cardinals, who are arguably the NFL's like worst run defense, and um, and that game was way out of hand. It was forty-five to ten. So people are looking at it like, oh, the the carry split was seven to five in favor of Jackson. But yeah, you know, the the 
the gap in the game was enormous and Melvin Gordon got hurt. So they know like Melvin Gordon's knee injury, right? So they're looking at it like, oh shit, Melvin Gordon, um, this could be serious. He could be missing time. We're not going to risk playing Austin Eckler at the end of this game, knowing we're going to have to ride him next game and into the future because Gordon's injury is probably a multi-week absence. And that's what we saw leading to Justin Jackson getting work. But if you look back to the game when um, Melvin Gordon was out, I think it was back in week seven, Austin Eckler didn't perform like, you know, the RB1 that Gordon would have. But in terms of, like, snaps, he was playing 95% of the snaps. He got 85% of the backfield touches there. That's what I think we're going to see more so going forward because that was against Tennessee, and they won the game 20-19, to which is a very close game. It's what I expect uh, against Pittsburgh. They're on the road at Pittsburgh next week. So I think we're going to see them ride Eckler again. And I would honestly be surprised if we saw Justin Jackson see more than, you know, 20% of the snaps. Yeah, as Nick said, in week seven, when uh, Gordon was out, Eckler played all the snaps. And that was a game where he wasn't really getting anything done on the ground, but they still had the faith in him to keep putting him out there and not put in Jackson, which against uh, the Steelers this week, they have a much more forgiving pat or run defense than the Titans. So I don't see any reason that they would uh, move away from Eckler when they didn't do it in the past. Yeah, and I think I think like Jackson's lack of involvement in the passing game too is probably going to hurt him because he had like 10 receptions in that game Gordon was out. He had a ton of receptions last week as well. So um, I, I see that's kind of how they're going to probably use their running backs really heavily through the air. So uh, I think by process of elimination, it's just get Jackson out of your lineup. DJ Moore is very hot, goes against Tampa Bay, so it's hard to sit him. Fitz is – you know, not someone you're getting excited about, but he's been scoring touchdowns in this new offense, if you want to call it. And they're heavy underdogs again against Green Bay. So should be a lot of passing again. So we could probably move on to the next question, which is from Dwayne Davis, double D's. He asks who to flex one point PPR. So we got a full PPR question. Kenny Galladay at the Rams, Amar Cooper at the Saints, Gus Edwards at at. Lana, who are you flexing, Noah? Are you going with the wide receiver? Or are you going with Gus? Are you riding the Gus bus, or what's going on? All right, for my flex, I think I'm going Galladay against the Rams. They have a really high over-under this week. They are getting uh, – they might get to lead back, so if he does come back, I'd be a little more hesitant. But I'm still going to roll with him. He's getting, like, 11 targets a game ever since Marvin Jones went down or ever since uh, that one game where he left in the fourth quarter. Um, Amari Cooper, they're going up against the Saints, but the Saints are playing – Last week they uh, only put up 31 points against the Falcons, who had a pretty, who have a pretty bad defense, and Dallas has a really good defense in comparison. So I'm not sure they're gonna have to throw all too much. And even though the Saints have a good run defense, I think Ezekiel Elliott can get some things done on the ground. And as for Gus Edwards against Atlanta, um, and Nick's gonna bring it up, I think, because he's a bigger Falcons fan than I am, because I don't really watch them too much. But Deion Jones is a good linebacker. Uh, if he's back, I'm not sure Gus Edwards is gonna be the same like RB1, back-end RB1 play that we would come to expect. Uh, he doesn't get involved in the passing game. He hasn't had a target over the past two games. He is getting the volume, but it's kind of a similar situation that we've seen in Carolina uh, the past two years. I know uh, McCaffrey's found the end zone a lot lately, but it's always a threat that Cam Newton finds the end zone in the red zone. And with Lamar Jackson, the same thing could happen. He could run a draw play or a read option and just take it himself. So he's not always going to be a lock to score those one- to two-yard touchdowns. So I think uh, for me, I'm going Galladay here is the safest play. Probably going to get the most volume through the passing game. And the fact that it's one point PPR, uh, that brings a whole lot of value to him. Yeah, um, I, I think that's a good point you made with Gus Edwards and the, and the you know, Lamar Jackson kind of stealing those goal line touches. Because you look back at last week, right? And if you started Gus Edwards, you're I, I don't really know. I mean, you're excited about it, but he gives you like 117, I think, total yards didn't have a single catch and didn't score a touchdown. So that's like, you know, this is this being a full PPR, the question asked like Gus Edwards becomes a, a kind of a risky play because if he doesn't, you know, carry the ball 20 something times and go over a hundred yards, he is not involved in the passing game. Like he's been their workhorse for the last two weeks and he hasn't seen a single target. Like that should be telling. And the fact that Ty Montgomery got super involved last game tells you that, you know, that's the role that they expect um, Ty Montgomery to have moving forward, which means Gus is probably not going to be involved in the passing game. Like they haven't been fluky. That's just how they're going to use him. So um, yeah, I mean, my answer it would also be Galladay. And I think, you know, the injury thing is something to definitely take into account. I think you really have to monitor Deion Jones and you have to monitor a keep to leave because both of them are all pro defenders. Um, Deion Jones is a stud linebacker for the Falcons. Really, really good in coverage and uh, a good run stopper as well. So that's a downgrade to Gus Edwards if he's back. 
He is expected to be back, I believe. He was, he was close to playing last week. They still have to test him out, I think they said Thursday. We're filming this Wednesday, so something might change in the meantime. But Jones is a guy that would, you know, affect Edwards' um, – his, his value this week for me. And it just being a full PPR league, I'm probably fading Edwards here. Galladay, like you said, Tlaib is going to be a major factor in, uh, in his projections. Regardless, though, uh, the volume is going to be there. So if Tlaib is out, Galladay is a wide receiver one, in my opinion, because he's going to get the volume, and he also gets a really good matchup against a pass defense that's struggling without Tlaib. If Tlaib is back, it's going you know, to hurt his efficiency, but the volume will still be there. Cooper, I don't hate. He's been super hot, but he's kind of hard to – uh, trust in terms of his ceiling consistency and I kind of expect Marshawn Lattimore to shadow him um, they haven't used Marshawn Lattimore to shadow every week but they have done so in games where the opposing teams um, have a strong wide receiver one on the outside or you know that's their main weapon so if you're looking at this chart you see that uh, Marshawn Lattimore has been used to shadow like four or five times. His most recent shadow was against uh, Alshon Jeffrey in week 11, where he held him to literally one catch, three yards on two targets. So looking at the Dallas offense, besides Zeke, you don't have to worry about anything on the outside. Um, telling me that Lattimore is probably going to end up shadowing Cooper. Um, now, Lattimore did have a really slow start to the year in terms of coverage, and that Saints defense overall just looked kind of shitty. But over the last five weeks or so, I'm looking at, like the grades on PFF and Lattimore has been every, every bit as much of the, the high end cornerback that he was last year over the last five games. So he's getting back to form. This team's getting back to form. I don't love Cooper. Galladay is just so strong um, for you to try to make the case for Cooper here. So Galladay would definitely be our play here. Dwayne start that man with confidence. And we have the final question of the day, Steven, I believe you are a new Patron. So thank you, sir. We appreciate the support. You are really getting your money's worth in this in this question here. He has a lot of them. This is uh this is a big question here. We're gonna try to break it down question by question and go along. And I think this will be an interesting one because there's a lot of assets to this and it's not all just fantasy football. So he asks, Who do you have as the offensive and defensive rookie of the year? If you could pick players to keep in a dynasty in a standard and or PPR format as an RB2 or less and or wide receiver two or less. Who would you choose? Any potential breakout players for next year? What injured players and or future free agents should have a big season next year? Greatest Falcon player, not necessarily statistically, but, you know, what do you think? Um, I've only played in standard leagues. Why or why not? Would you recommend PPR and or half PPR? I know it's a lot, and I don't expect you to answer them all. Well, God damn it, Steven. We're going to answer every single one of them as in-depth as we possibly can because this is what we do for our Patreon. So, again, if you all want to subscribe to Patreon, that's the website slash BDGE. So, Stephen, Noah, let's collectively answer this. Who do you have as the offensive and defensive rookie of the year? Uh, we're going to assume, obviously, that this is just NFL-related, not fantasy, because defensive rookie of the year wouldn't make sense for fantasy. If it were fantasy football, it obviously has to be Saquon Barkley. He, he's, like, in the, in the running for um, rookie of the year, or overall, like, MVP fantasy-wise. But when we look at the offensive – players um there are a few guys that come to mind actually there's only two guys that really come to mind for me and it's Saquon Barkley and Baker Mayfield and I wanted to pull up the Vegas odds for this one and as you can see Barkley is a pretty um overwhelming favorite right now he is a three and a half favorite to win the offensive rookie of the year per Vegas Baker Mayfield is there at plus 200 Barkley's statistics have just been too just, just too good to um ignore at the running back position right now However, however, I mean, how do you see this playing out between, I mean, Chubb is on there, obviously he's a 20 to one underdog. So there's probably no shot he gets in there. Um, if, if you're predicting now, who do you see in week 17 or whenever the fucking awards thing is, I don't even know how they do these awards to be honest with you, who is standing on the podium, raising the trophy, Noah? For me, I'm going to go with, I don't know. I think I'm going Baker Mayfield to bring a team that like hadn't won a game in like 10 years to bring them to like four, six and one at this point. I mean, if you think back one or two year, two years ago now, uh, Ezekiel Elliott and Dak Prescott, they were obviously on the same team. Dak Prescott won over Ezekiel Elliott, even though Zeke led the league in rushing and was like a phenomenal player, similar to Saquon Barkley. I think they always just kind of favor the quarterback because he's more of seen as a leader. And the Giants still aren't a great team, uh, no matter how much your friend on your E-Town Get Down videos uh, gets hyped over him. I'm not buying in. Sorry if you're watching this. Not a, not a huge fan. Nikki Snacks. Not a view of the team. <laughs> <laughs> Nikki Snacks Incorporated. Yeah, um, I, I'm with <laughs> you. I think uh, I think Baker's going to end up pulling this off. And well, I, 
I think it comes down to like Barkley's going to keep putting up the numbers. It's all going to come down to uh, if Baker can win. You know, I don't even think he necessarily needs to put up great stats going forward. I'm looking at the schedule right now. They just came off that win against uh, Cincinnati. They play at uh, at Houston next week. Tough game versus Carolina at home at Denver, Cincinnati at home at Baltimore. So at Houston, at Denver, at Baltimore, three super, super difficult matchups. But the offense has been really good since they got rid of Hugh Jackson. Um, I think if Baker can – okay, so I think he definitely wins against the Bengals at home. The Carolina game should be good. I think if he could pull off – if he can go three and two down the stretch, I think he definitely wins the MVP award or the Offensive Rookie of the Year award if he can go three and two in those five games. Um if he could win two of the games, the Bengals and maybe one of the other games, I think that would make it closer. So I think the the argument here is whether or not he can win the games. But Barkley, if he keeps up his statistical fucking greatness at this point, it's going to be hard to overcome that. But um, for me, yeah, it comes down to those two, and it comes down to whether or not Baker can keep chalking up dubs for, for the Browns here. And, uh, man, I'd be so excited if I was a Browns fan. Like, that that is the only quarterback that – I was super excited about going into the year and he has really lived up to it. And I think he's just um, such a good cornerstone. The league itself is just in such a good spot with like young quarterbacks between him, Mahomes, Jared Goff, and all these new coaches and stuff coming in. It's going to be fun to watch for the next 10 years or so. The defensive rookie of the year. Um, who's your pick for your, for DR, D-Roy? This might be a homer pick, but I'm going with Derwin James. The guy is just, he's an animal. He looks like he's been in the league for five years. He locks down tight ends. He just makes big hits, big plays, week in, week out. I mean, the fact that they got him at the 17th pick is unreal. I thought he was easy top 10, but I guess NFL GMs just don't want to win. So that's my pick. Pretty easy for me. Darius Leonard's a close second, but he missed last game. He's got a sprained ankle. He might not play this week, so I don't know. Uh, he has been great, but I'm just going darn with. Yeah, I hear you. Derwin's been a fucking game changer for them. Um, I, I don't know what this defense would look like without him, considering Bosa's been out for so long. He's been one of the highest graded um, safeties this year. Like overall, not even rookie wise, he has been ridiculous um, on the pass rush. Good in coverage as well. I'm excited to see what happens now that Bosa is back and he's going to, you know, continue to play more of a full time role going forward. So um, I wonder if they're going to you know, try to utilize both of them still heavily as pass rushers, or if that means Bosa will take the main duties as a pass rusher and then Derwin will kind of step back and play more of a coverage role. Um, but yeah, man, them getting him at 17 was, was just ridiculous and a uh, big, big corner piece for that defense. Like you said, Darius Leonard is a close, um, close, close second for me. Uh, he uh, He's leading the NFL in tackles. He has like 114 tackles, and he's already missed a game. And it's not even close. The next closest guy is like 97. He has been an all-around like stud for that defense. Good pass rusher, good run stopper, good in coverage. Like All of these things have been phenomenal by Darius Leonard. Um, Second-round pick, so he is going to be the cornerstone of that defense for a long time going forward. Um, but like you said, miss some time, might miss another game. If you know it, it, In a tight race, you can't be missing games. That's going to kind of – um, shoot you down the rankings list. So those would be my my guys as well. And the next couple of questions are kind of tough to answer, or you know, they're they're more general questions. It says if you could pick players to keep in a dynasty in a in a dy so standard dynasty league and or PPR format as RB two or less and or wide receiver two or less, who would you choose? Any potential breakout players for next year? Free agents, injury players that we see having a big season. So, I mean, it's hard to say, like, who you would choose in Dynasty to keep in Dynasty because I, mean, I don't know what your team looks like. What I would kind of say is this. Like, one of the resources that I like to use in the offseason to help me prepare for, like, the next season or Dynasty-wise is a website called SpotTrack. So, if you head to SpotTrack.com, you'll see um, – I'll link it down below. It's S-P-O-T-R-A-C.com. And you'll see the main header where it's the different sports. Go to NFL. And the NFL dropdown will have a ton of different options. I go over to the free agents option. So you click on the free agents option and it will tell you which players are going to be unrestricted free agents at the end of this year. And then you could filter it obviously by position and stuff. And that probably gives you the best idea of, um, you know, who do expect to take on bigger roles next year and who you can expect to, you know, either retire or move on to a new team. So that would be one of the, main things that I would do. And, you know, on this channel, I like to kind of teach you guys ways to become better fantasy players, not just 
try to give you stats and analysis or my opinion, because you have to form your own opinion, I think, to kind of be successful moving forward. Um, that being said, yeah, I mean, it's really going to take me kind of looking at your team to seeing um, who you would like to like keep, because obviously you have your team and you don't get to choose new players next year. But if we're looking at some of the skill players where there are guys coming off a contract, um, we have Larry Fitzgerald is on his contract here. We don't know if he's going to keep playing. And we've seen this guy, Christian Kirk, who has looked pretty good as a rookie already. Um, and if Fitzgerald's out of the picture, Kirk is obviously going to take over as that number one threat in the receiving game because they have almost no one else going on there. Um, so I like Larry Fitz. Is there anyone else? Who else on this list, whether it's a wide receiver, running back, whatever it is, quarterback, um, that you see being a free agent that would kind of impact the fantasy landscape for you next year, Noah? Uh, one guy I see is Tyrell Williams. I mean, the Chargers, I think, want to keep him because I'm pretty sure they tendered him at like a, a second round level. But if he can like go to a team and become a number one there, he has the skill set to really break out and be like a solidified number one. Like two years ago or three years ago when Keenan Allen uh, was out for the whole year, he was pretty much like a top 15 guy the whole season. As for running backs, I saw Mark Ingram. So if he's out of there, Next year, Alvin Kamara is top five locked in. And uh, Tevin Coleman as well. We've seen him this year kind of struggle. But if he gets to a new team, he has a skill set to really be a three-down back. Yeah, I actually – I really like that Tyrell Williams call. Um, I didn't realize he was going to be a free agent. So, yeah, like, like you said, when Keenan Allen was out a couple of years ago, Tyrell stepped in and was legitimately like a top 12 fantasy wide receiver. Um, and they haven't really utilized him as much. He's making big plays, but he's not being used as an all-around wide receiver. That also means Mike Williams will get a chance to step in as that number two outside role. We've seen him do his thing in the red zone, but he's not getting enough volume consistently week over week. But if Tyrell is out of the picture, we are going to see him get a boost. So I, I could see Williams going to a spot where I would like to see him maybe in hmm, – I would like to – there are so many offensive players that I would like to see go to the Colts right now. I feel like there are so many good fits – for Andrew Luck's offense, Tyrell Williams being one of them. I think there's a lot of places he could probably end up going. Wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't doubt if he ended up going to like the Jets or something like that. Um, but yeah, I like Tyrell there. I like Mike Williams now. Hate they're both. Hate, <laughs> why do you hate to see that? I think it's done if, if he goes there. <laughs> I'm not sure Darnold's going to even know he's on his team. Just throw it to the cornerback. I'm not, I'm not big on that yet. That's true. I just think Jets have so much cap space that they're just going to go out and go fucking nuts and free agents on the uh, offensive side of the ball. Who else we got? Yeah, you said Mark Ingram is on his contract here. That's interesting. Like, I wonder where he's going to go um, because there are going to be dumbass teams that make plays in free agency. Same thing with Tevin Coleman, right? He's a free agent. They re-signed Devonta Freeman to a big, um, to a big contract in the summer. And that's interesting for me because I own Devonta Freeman in one or two dynasty leagues. And, you know, as soon as he got hurt, I was like, fuck, like this is not good, right? He might be losing his job or whatever. Um, but Tevin Coleman has not really looked that good. Uh, and, and with the re-signing of Devonta Freeman's contract and them drafting Edo Smith, it seems like those are the two are probably going to be the ones who going forward. They're not going to be able to afford Tevin Coleman because someone else is going to pay up for him. So it would be interesting to see where Tevin Coleman lands. I definitely think if he's given that workhorse feature role, he could finish as a top 15 fantasy running back just, just based off volume and his three-down skill set. So that becomes interesting. I think Edo Smith as the number two there because they always use the number two. Um, he would become an interesting play as well. And we have, let's see, who else? Uh, Golden Tate is going to be a free agent at the end of this year, so he's kind of interesting to see where he goes. Um, I have one other situation. Um, yeah. Alex Collins, Buck Allen, and Ty Montgomery are all free agents next year, so maybe they just ride with Gus Edwards as the guy. He's on a rookie contract, and he wasn't drafted, right? So he's going to be paid like pennies on the dollar. And mm -hmm. I think Collins is a good player. Uh, he hasn't been show uh, showcased too much as of late, so maybe a team can get him cheap. And I really think he has a skill set to be like a top 20 guy next year if he's the featured back. That's interesting. So we have all those running backs going to be free agents. Uh, Devin Funches is going to be a free agent. I'm not sure what they're going to do there because DJ Moore is obviously coming in. Curtis Samuel is looking pretty good too. So it's possible they let Devin Funches yeah. walk and then DJ Moore becomes, you know, solidified low end wide receiver two in fantasy. So he's someone I'm looking at. Not that you could probably buy him that cheap because his, his capital is that first round capital. So it's not like in a dynasty league, you're necessarily able to trade for guys like that um, on the low, but he's someone I'd be looking to draft in dynasty if you can. And uh, let me take a look at running backs. I haven't seen too much. Uh, Frank Gore. He might get picked up by a museum uh, <laughs> as an artifact, you know, love that. Uh, <laughs> 
maybe Kenyon Drake will finally take over the workload there, but I probably want nothing to do with that yeah. Miami situation overall. Um, Peyton Barber is going to be a free agent. Not sure what the fuck that's going to do. I wouldn't be surprised if Le'Veon Bell signed there because they might just give him a huge contract. That'd be great to see what he says to Jameis after he throws like 10 picks every game. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be a that'd be a funny duo back there. I bet you that they they'd be pretty fucking good together in fantasy football, man. I just dump offs for days. Mm-hmm. Twenty targets. That's all they need, man. Honestly, if teams started using Le'Veon Bell like a wide receiver or a slot receiver, he'd be so good. Yeah, yeah if he goes to the Colts next year. I mean, it's a wrap. Their offense is going to be unreal. Yeah, I don't think they will though. I think that the team that signs Le'Veon Bell is going to have to be a team with a quarterback on a rookie contract. Otherwise, you know, any any quarterback that's not on a rookie contract is on a fat contract, right? And if you're going to use that amount of money on the quarterback and the running back position, like you're going your team is going to be in fucking shambles. So, I feel like I, I like I like the situation there if he does go there, like that's a crazy duo, but they have so much money locked up in luck right now that I don't know if uh, I don't know if they'd rather spend the money on offense or solidify that defense and just get like cheaper alternatives um, like someone like Alex Collins like just sign him and and roll with him Naeem Hines Marlon Mack or whatever like Marlon Mack's you know looking pretty good too so I'm not necessarily sold that they'll spend the money but someone will do something dumb this free agency and and I'm excited to see who does it <laughs> let's see what tight ends we got okay so Eifert's a free agent. Yeah, Jared Cook. Um, Delaney Walker got re-signed this year, right? Didn't they re-sign him for a couple of years? I feel like they extended him at the in the summer. Otherwise, because I made a video kind of similar to this in the summer. And I was talking about, like, best late-round guys and keeper in Dynasty Leagues. And I mentioned Jonu Smith. He was someone I was super high on going into the year because Delaney Walker was on um, the last year of his contract. And then I thought they re-signed him because – um, I remember being pissed because I have I have uh, Jonu in a bunch of spots, but I'm not sure. Someone's gonna have to fact check me on that. If that is the case, I mean Jonu's looking pretty good right now, so I wouldn't be surprised if he kind of took over that role with the injury being serious to Walker. Reminds me of like a Trey Burton type of guy, not too big, but he's got the wheels and he broke a big play on Monday night. Exactly. All you need is guys who can kind of well, run. Demetrius after Harris, he's a guy for Kansas City. When he plays and he gets looks, like, yeah. Um, for Demetrius Harris, I was saying like. He's obviously behind Kelsey, but if he goes to a new team, I mean, he has the skill set, the athleticism. I think he could be like a sneaky guy next year. Yeah, actually, I like that call. I'm going to pull up his player profile or profile right now and look at it because I know he's a guy um, that I've heard a lot of buzz about, but obviously playing behind Kelsey, you're not going to get anything going on. But as a free agent, yeah, if he can find a role for himself somewhere else, 40-yard dash time, a 4.57, 93rd percentile, 89th percentile, weight adjusted speed score. 84th percentile burst score, uh, best comparable players, Ladarius Green. They don't have much of his production up in here. I'm not sure if he didn't participate in the pro day or whatever. But, yeah, just from the raw metrics, you're looking at a guy who's almost like a tight end wide receiver hybrid. So, yeah, if he can go somewhere, that would be interesting. Put him on the fucking Patriots, bro. <laughs> this dude is six foot seven. Yeah. He, that is wild. He's a big boy. He is a big boy for sure. So, uh so, yeah, I mean, the best thing to do is just is do your research on that website because I can guarantee you 99% of the people you're playing against are not going to be doing this type of research. So if you're going to go in depth and figure out guys like this to draft that are good stock players that you can kind of wait on, that's my best advice to you. It's hard for us to get more specific than that without seeing your actual team and who are your choices of keepers or what the dynamics of your league are. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's the best we could do on that question. I think you had a couple more. Let's see. Greatest Falcon player, not necessarily on stats, but what do you think? I mean, I'm only 26 years old, so I haven't really seen prior to that who played. Obviously, we have Deion Sanders, and we have a lot of older players back in the day. My favorite player, the reason I'm a Falcons fan to begin with, is because Michael Vick. I mean, he came in the league and absolutely fucking enamored me, and I was like, he's my favorite athlete of all time. I stuck with the Falcons since then, since then but I love Michael Vick. Um, Jamal Anderson, you know, I got that throwback jersey. Shout out the Jersey Jungle. And uh, Roddy White's my boy, too. So those are some of my favorite players over the years. I like Michael Turner, man. He was a stud for a couple of years, too. Super underrated running back. Those are my favorite Falcons. Um, I've only done standard. Why or why not would you recommend PPR and or half PPR? Uh, oh, man, I couldn't, I couldn't fucking recommend that more. So I don't necessarily love full PPR, but I would 100% prefer that over standard. It just opens up the player pool, man. 
Um, when you're playing standard, like you would never even consider starting a guy like Theo Riddick or you would never consider starting guys like that. And when you have half PPR or PPR, it makes um, tight ends more valuable too. It makes these running backs who are involved in the passing game, which is such a big part of the NFL nowadays. So they're actually big parts of the NFL game. And now they're becoming big parts of the fantasy game too. So I don't know, like, no, do you play in any standard league still? I don't, I don't think I've ever played in a standard league. I just, I've been in half PPR on like every league I've ever played in. I just, for you. <laughs> I haven't like experienced a full point PPR, but I just feel like half is the best because a guy like Jarvis Landry, like last year he was catching like a hundred balls for what, like 900 yards. I wouldn't want him to be like a wide receiver number five overall. I'd rather be in a half PPR league where his receptions aren't uh, as valuable as a guy who like Julio Jones who won't catch as many uh, passes, but he'll get the yards, won't get the touchdowns. But I'd rather be in a half PPR league where uh, the scoring is more balanced, in my opinion. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, half PPR is the perfect settle between the two. And I just think adding that extra element of like scoring just makes the, the games more fun to watch because you have your players going – and if you catch, like, a seven-yard pass, it's like, okay. But that's also, like, 1.2 points now. You're like, oh, okay, sick. Like, my guy caught a pass as well. So it gets a little more juice flowing in, in the membrane. You know what I mean? So half PPR, uh, I think, is absolutely the way to go from now on. I would never play in a standard league again. If I got the invite, I would turn that shit down real quick. So uh, I think we handled all your questions there. And I think we've handled the majority of the Patreon questions that came in for this Q&A session. I hope y'all enjoyed. We tried to be as informative as possible. Um, and that's going to wrap it up. So, as always, thumbs up the video if you enjoyed. Go check us out on patreon.com slash BDGE where you will get personalized Q&As answered from one of us. You will get a private weekly live stream that I do. You will get my weekly rankings, all of that kind of shit. You will get it. Just go check it out. Subscribe to us. Uh, follow Noah on Twitter. Follow myself on Twitter. Our tweeters will be linked probably right above us the entire video because I'll edit that in afterwards. And uh, that's it. Any, any uh, parting words for the people for, for week 13, Noah? Well, I appreciate the feedback from last week. Hopefully I grew off of that. And hope you enjoyed the video, as Nick said. Yeah, I think you did a uh, stellar job this week, Noah. And thank you for thank you for joining me. Um, now go go enjoy college. 